So Rob, getting to talk to John Stryker Meyer, uh, Tilt. He's uh, he's an amazing guy, and and what a great opportunity. Uh, definitely became a personal hero of mine after getting to read his book. Um, how long have uh, you been working with him? Uh, well, I think we got in touch um, about two years ago, Sam. And um, at the time, I think I was a bit nervous about talking to him. Um, he's a, you know a big hero of mine. I've read all his books. And uh, he was very warm and friendly and so generous and, and took us under his wing. Um, and he's looked after us for the last couple of years, given us so much insight and detail um, and never, you know, never turned us down for anything. He's always been there. He's a, he's a trooper. And he gives such an incredible insight uh, during this interview in, into uh, SOG operations and the tactics and techniques and the procedures behind it. It's quite an interesting interview to do because we go into quite a lot of drilling into a lot of details with him. Um, it's not like just talking about combat experiences. It's very much talking about the life in SOG and all of the different aspects of operations, which um, we did it this way because we're interested in helping the guys out there, the players, the mission makers, the Zeus admins, who want those extra details uh, for when they want to make their missions uh, really authentic uh, and create a prairie fire experience. I think this will give a great perspective for some of our, our players as they're going into the game and not only bring these stories to them, but also help them to, to be able to integrate some of that into their gameplay, which is a pretty unique thing to be able to do. Um, right, let's get into the, the sort of interview then, I guess, um, as we've we've spent quite a lot of time uh, cluing up on 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 SOG with you, guys, with you. Uh, I, but a lot of people may not know, you know, who watch this may not have a clue uh, what SOG is. So can you give us sort of from your point of view what, what SOG's mission was uh, and why you were over there running recon? Sure. Um, because of our government signing or agreeing to an accord in the early 60s, we agreed to have no combat troops in Laos or Cambodia. And of course, the communists in North Vietnam and Laos, they all agreed to it, but they never signed it. And publicly, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're agreeing. Well, they're lying because the communists as early as 1957 were beginning to reopen the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was the supply chain trails, a series of trails that came from North Vietnam, south through Laos into Cambodia. And then there's trails that went into uh, Vietnam. And uh, by the time I arrived in the secret war, and the secret war for us with SOG, it began in 64, it ended in 1972. And um, during that time, it, by the end, it, it was proved to be the highest casualty rate within the uh, entire war with over 100% casualties. Um, and that would be wounded in action, missing in action, killed in action. So some people like Bob Howard received eight Purple Hearts from eight different missions. And so that's the way it gets beyond 100. And uh, several of the recon guys would have multiple uh, Purple Hearts. And so the uh, combat was severe and uh, by the time I got there in 68, it had been going on for four years. And I arrived in May of 68. And of course, um, we had to find out what was going on. And the communists were coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We knew it, but we, we couldn't talk about it. And nobody would, the media certainly didn't report it if we talked about it. And the communists pretended that they weren't. And so we had to send recon teams in to see what they were doing. And when I arrived in May of 68, we had six FOBs. FOB one was Fubai, FOB two was Contoon, three was Quezon, which was closed in June. And then they reopened Mylock and they called that FOB three, which stayed open until the end of 68. Da Nang was FOB four, Bami Tuat FOB five, and then Ho Nuk Tao was FOB six. So five and six ran missions into Cambodia. Two ran mostly Laos, but some tri-border, which was Cambodia, Laos, and then uh, Viet South Vietnam. And uh, at the end of 68, they consolidated so that we had CCN at Da Nang, CCC, Contoon, and then CCS 
at Bami Tuit. And again, CCS focused on Cambodia, codenamed Daniel Boone, area of operations. We had Prairie Fire, codename for Laos, and Nickel Steel was uh, North Vietnam. And uh, when I arrived at FOB1, after going through the in-country training, we signed 20 uh, documents saying we wouldn't talk about SOG for 20 years. So after that signing, the indoctrination, the <laughs> briefing on what SOG was, running missions across the fence with two or three Green Berets with indigenous troops for recon teams, running in to see what they're doing. And then our missions did everything from area recon, which would be go in, do a trail watch, see what was going on, report it, look for possible targets for the Air Force, uh, down to point missions where we, uh, by 68, they were running fuel lines south. So we would target fuel lines, enemy caches, destroy them, contoon to some slam operations where they would put in a hatchet force on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, block the traffic, and then the traffic would get backed up and the Air Force would come in and hammer the backed up trucks. And the NVA responded quickly to those and they put a lot of pressure on the hatchet force. And so uh, when I arrived at FOB1 at Fubai, uh, we flew up in South Vietnamese uh, our Air Force and we had a 219th squadron, the Special Operations Squadron for the South Vietnamese Air Force, codenamed King Bees. And that in and of itself was a surprise because, and we went through training both in the States and in country, we, we saw Hueys. And the photographs in the newspapers were, hey, the war in Vietnam was Hueys. Well, here we are. We jumped on H-34 Sikorsky's that had the old nine cylinder reciprocal engine that were in the B-17s during World War II. And that was culture shock. And we, of course, later came to highly respect the King B pilots and the majority of whom were just absolutely fearless. And more importantly, uh, they put us in and took us out of targets. So when I arrived at FOB-1, we got off the helicopter, a recon team gets on a helicopter, goes into Laos, and disappears. To this day, the Spike Team Idaho, the two Americans, Glenn Lane and Robert Owen, are still amongst the 50 plus Green Berets that are still listed as missing in action from the secret war in Laos and Cambodia, plus 100 additional aviators, both Air Force, Marine Corps, Army, all of whom died. And that's why you'll see in the back my POW MIA uh, remembrance flag because we still have 1,285 as of today, February 24th, 2021. And there's there's a, a lot of effort going on to bring remains home still uh, for people. There is, but the network. COVID virus has slowed things down <clears throat> immensely. And Laos just shut the whole program down, wouldn't let any of the teams in on the ground. And, um, one of our efforts has been to try to encourage uh, more due diligence on Southeast Asia remains because the soil in Southeast Asia is the most acidic in the world. And after 50 years, the soil is beginning to eat away at the bones so that uh, mother nature is removing whatever evidence is there in terms of remains. That's one more aspect to the whole POW MIA mission. And the SOA helps with, with that? Yes, sir. Um, in 2014, the SOA formed a POW MIA committee is chaired by Mike Taylor, who has several years in Vietnam with SOG. He ran recon, hatchet force, and then uh, flew as a cubby rider out of uh, NKP, Thailand, which I think was for over 18 months. Mm -hmm. So he saw a great deal of combat. He knows the terrain, the AO. And then after approximately a year or so, uh, we combined it. So it would be the SOA, Special Operations Association, combined with the SFA, Special Forces Association. It's a POW MIA committee. Mike has been very active with it. They have monthly meetings with DPAA and the National League of POW MIA Families, which is responsible for this iconic image. They're the ones that created it. And that's been the image 
that uh, we all turn to to remind us of our missing in action. And uh, Mike even went to Laos and North Vietnam three years ago on a joint committee to meet NVA soldiers, including some soldiers that were on the NVA uh, hunter killer teams that were designed to hunt SOG recon teams and to kill the Americans. And it was a joint effort, very respectful to have more information back and forth, trying to prove a flow of information. So yes, that's a great question. And Mike has just done outstanding work there. And, and as you know, in our game, we have a bright light mission, which which is a SOG mission um, to go in and rescue a pilot who's been captured um, and he's just been captured. So that's why it's still a bright light. But but you guys also have the mission to uh, to, to raid prisoner of war camps um, or, or suspected ones and try to bring guys back. Uh, did you ever do any of those yourself? Yeah, we tried. Uh, we had one target where it was Echo 4. We went in October 6, 1968, one day after Lynn Black and uh, ST Alabama had their historic mission where they came up against uh, an NVA division. And our secondary mission was to get to the, try to get to the POW MIA camp that Intel reports gave us. We never, we never got there. The uh, second day we were on the ground, we made heavy contact. We were in contact for two hours before we got uh, attack air. And then we were in contact to the bitter end and we stacked up the bodies where they kept coming at us. And then the King Bee pulled us out at last light. And in my case, I was down to the last magazine where we had gone through over 600 rounds, last hand grenade and the last round for the M79 when we got extracted on that target. So we didn't make there, make it. Um, a couple of years later, or maybe one year later, we had an all NVA team that were Chuhoys, that were North Vietnamese soldiers that came and joined SOG. They were vetted, they were trained. And a one zero was Sergeant Pat uh, Eddington, who appeared Asian and he was tall. And that team was unique because they could literally walk down the trails in Laos or Cambodia, wherever they went, because the North Vietnamese soldiers knew a lot of the code words. They, they dressed in NVA uniforms and Pat would be all duded up looking like an NVA. And because there had been Chinese that were tall, they just assumed that he was one of the advisors. And I tell you this because one of his missions was specifically to go to an American POW MIA camp. The team got in, they were on the ground with a good insertion and as they were moving through the jungle towards the camp on the FM frequency, an NVA speaking perfect English came up and said, Sergeant Eddington by name, we know that RT Cobra is on the ground, you're the one zero and you're going to this POW MIA camp or POW camp, whatever the NVA would say. You've got a choice. You can turn around and leave or if you continue, by the time you get to this camp, every American here will be dead. I will kill them all. So that's really reflective of two major issues. One, the compromise, and the fact they knew we were on the ground and Pat had a really difficult choice. So he, had to, he turned around and called for an extraction. But that's just one mission where trying to get to a POW MIA camp, that was the result. You know, it's a tough one, isn't it? There's, there's, there's a lot of guys that went down behind enemy lines and uh, got captured and a lot of guys got executed. It was, it was pretty grim uh, being, being special forces. That was the risks you guys took going over the fence. Yes, sir. And, and uh, mentioning the bright light, the bright light was by far the most dangerous mission because we were going in for down piles or if a recon team or a hatchet force needed support then that would be the mission. And for a bright light, there was no food, one canteen of water. You carried extra bandages, extra ammo and body bags to go in to get them out. And they knew you were coming. So you had to work tack air and the combat was 
in most instances guaranteed. Occasionally, some of our bright light teams were able to get in with minimal contact, but that didn't happen very often. How about um, uh, snatching prisoners of war yourself, so turning the tables? <laughs> Um, you know, I point to our living, uh, not our living, but our legend, Dick Meadows out of CCC. Dick was the most successful at capturing POWs. He had 12 or 13, and I think it was one year or 18 months out of running recon out of Contoon back in 67, maybe early part of 68. And so he's of legend. We had uh, ambushes set up several times. And each time, for one reason or another, we had to pull it down. And the, uh, the most uh, fateful one was we got in, moved quickly, got across the trail, set up the ambush. We had a wiretap going also. Sal, our Vietnamese uh, counterpart, the team leader, had a wiretap running. We had the ambush set up on the trail. And we were inserted. It was so successful that people... Enemy soldiers were going back and forth on the trail, just diddy bopping. They had their AKs on their shoulders if they had weapons. And we're taking pictures of all this. And then Spider came back for a combo check and I said, hey, I gave him the code. We're ready for a POW snatch. And um, he said, do nothing. I'm at 10,000 feet. I can't see the mountain you're on, let alone the LZ you guys were extract, uh, inserted on. So that began a series of events. We pulled in all the claymores. At that point, we heard the dogs that were down at the LZ. We had tanks above us on another trail. We moved to last light, and then we went up a stream during the night because we knew they had dogs. And we did little, little branch things off the banks of this little brook or a small stream, whatever it would be. And then um, we set up an RON after a couple of hours. I was facing the stream and that was the night where the NVA crawled up and touched my boot. And then he left without an incident. And the next morning we got to the top of a hill. We took all day to march up this mountain. We moved and we set up our RON that night. And during the night, the Russians came in for an aerial resupply. So that's one of our more astonishing missions. We were just glad to survive it, but, uh, that was the most outlandish, you know, way of not pulling it off. Because we were, you know, uh, Bubba and I were talking about it. Because, you know, if you got a POW, you had r, &R for five days anywhere in the world, and you got a $100 bonus. So we were really excited. And then uh, we had to shut it down to survive another day in SOG. Well, I, re I really enjoyed reading the story about the, the uh, NVA grabbing you by the foot. Um, can you, can you still recall exactly what that felt like the moment? Oh, it's, well, he didn't grab it. What happened, he was, obviously he was a veteran soldier because the embankment came up to where I was sitting facing that little brook was about 12, 15 feet high. And he crawled up that, but he only moved when the wind blew the trees. So if in the event that he made any noise, the trees would make noise. So eventually, I mean, it took him a while. I'm sitting there with my feet spread. I have my car 15 pointed right at him. I couldn't see him. You could do this with your hand, your hand in front of your face, and you couldn't see the hand. You could feel the air. But I could hear him. And um, at some point, he just touched the boot. He didn't grab it. He touched his boot. I heard him go. I heard him catch his breath. And he was cool cucumber because he waited until the trees blew. Then he went back down the hill and uh, he and his partner left. And at first light, we went the other way back up the mountain. So do you think he thought you were sleeping or do you think that he just knew you were about to blow him away? I think he knew that he had my undivided attention. I don't think he wanted to taste that car 15 ammo. Yeah. Would you have done the same? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Oh, yeah. I would have backed off because uh, knowing that the because my I was sitting there, he touched the sole of the boot or the tip. I forget, right? but I could feel him touch it. So he knew I had to be awake. And if it was me, I would have been glad to get out of there alive. 
you know and, and i guess that takes amazing discipline and training to sit there with your finger on the trigger in a situation like that in the pitch black you can't see where you can't make eye contact with your bodies there's right. no hand signals there's nothing you're just, just you in the black yeah and you know earlier in the night um sal had climbed a tree and he came back and said there were he counted over a hundred lights of NVA soldiers coming up that mountain, searching for us with dogs. And so we put out mace and uh, powdered mace and black pepper along some of the trails as we went up that, that little creek or brook there. And uh, it, it messed up a couple of dogs' noses. You could hear them howling uh, with pain, which made me happy. Um, but we knew that we had a major uh, effort by the enemy to come find us. Luckily, they didn't that night. And by the time they came back, we were long gone. And we really covered our tracks carefully as we went up that mountain. We literally climbed the mountain all day to get to the top around about last light. Is, is that the same mission where you used the Spectre? Uh, no. No. No, we did not. That was another mission that we used. We went through three or four specters. That was back in uh, February 1970. And, and I guess it was fairly routine for you guys to be on the ground overnight. So you were going in, it was probably a four or five day mission usually. Is that right? Yes, we usually plan for a five day. And um, on this one, because of the weather, we were on the ground for five days. And... Um, it got to the point between the trackers, the SOG being compromised at levels that we weren't aware of. And um, like, for example, when we left Vietnam, we were told there were spotters who would see the helicopters and what their azimuth was leaving FOB1 or leaving the launch site at Quang Tri. And then when you cross the Ashaw Valley heading into Laos, they had other watch points along the way that would shoot an azimuth as to where we were going. So many times, once we were on the ground, there would be trackers within hours. And then the trick was to try to lose the trackers or at least try to get, if you had a point mission, to get to your target to accomplish the mission before you got out. Uh, it must have been exhausting to always, to know there's always somebody on your ass. Really frustrating. I mean, and when I when we landed in '68, the NVA had 25 to 35,000 NVA troops there, and they forced the local population to work with them. You know how that goes: work with us or die. They had no choice, and uh, <clears throat> it wasn't uh, really really uh, something where they could uh, have a choice. They just had to get it with the program. And if not, you know, they were, it was just really uh, very unpleasant. So what did you do to deal with trackers tilt? Well, the first thing would be the pepper and the mace. Uh, my favorite tracker story with the dogs is the Frenchman. Um, on his first mission, he had the standard 22 uh, automatic, semi-automatic pistol with him that was silenced. And they had dogs and the one zero told him to go back and to take care of the dog. He went back and when the dog came up over the hill, he killed the dog and then he put in a toe popper so that when the dog's handler got there, he blew off his foot. And so that's one of my favorite uh, uh, dog stories. I guess you would have fish hooked as well to uh, sometimes to do um, like hasty ambushes and things or not? Uh, say that again, please. Did you kind of fish hook, you know, to go back and, and, and watch your oh. own trail? Um, we, we seldom did that. We did it once, and um, we had so much enemy activity coming from our other flank that we weren't able to, uh, to stay and to do the complete follow-through with it. And, and I guess you put you generally put toe poppers on the trail and then dog leg? turn 90 degrees and get out <laughs> oh yeah there. we left behind uh many toe poppers that's for sure and uh and then we had to mark them down on the map so that if any other teams came in 
that would be in the Intel report for the, for, for those uh, targets. Mm -hmm. And the, the toe poppers, for anybody that's not familiar, it's a small explosive device that had a pressure release on it. So they had a safety. For us, you put it in the ground, and when they walked on it, it would be their foot that would hit it, and it would usually blow off toes and part of their feet. And that would be the discouraged trackers. Yeah, well, we, we have quite a few experiences of that in our game, and I'm looking forward to showing it to you. You know, when it, the feeling we always have is playing it is like um, being being between a hammer and an anvil. You know, you've got the, you've got patrols in front of you or or a big trail, and then the, 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 the and then the, the trackers are. You hear the warning shots, you know, the signal shots, so you know that they're getting close, and and so you're stuck with with a trail in front of you and trackers behind and. That's not a nice place to be. Um, right, and, and it was a little bit more complicated than that because when we were in triple, uh, when we were in layouts, triple canopy, and we never were on a trail. So the trackers, based on if they were able to get like, say the observers who saw the helicopters come, then they would get to the LZ. And then from the LZ, they would try to look for our trail and of course, um, our tail gunners trained extensively at trying to cover up any signs of our movement through the jungle. But their trackers were good and they're indigenous. A lot of times the locals would work with the NVA because they had to. They knew the territory, they knew the jungle, and they would be part of the team that would be out hunting for us. And um, it was just... Uh, part of the, one of the games of being on the ground, just trying to see how far away we could get. And they would try to direct us sometimes. So if they're firing shots to your left and your right, they want you to go to another direction somehow. And of course, where they wanted you to go was a location we did not want to go. Mm. Yeah, and we can confirm that on Christmas day of 68, we were on the ground, made contact, and we were on a very steep knoll and we couldn't go to the west, we couldn't go to the south. And the north side of this hill was really steep, but the northeast side, there was like a little area of, of the, like a dirt that could have gone over and gotten us to the mountain where we could have gone further up the hill. But we, because of Lynn Black saying, hey, that area is quiet, we should go there but on the other hand, why is it quiet? Because we had firefights. At that point, uh, we had thrown hand grenades down the south side of the mountain and the south uh, east side of the mountain, and the fires had started. And so the fires are coming up the mountain towards us, that little hill that we were on, and the northeast was quiet. And then Spider called me on the radio. He said, hey, I just got an intel report. Do not go to the northeast. There's an ambush set up. And the way we knew that, we learned later, the Frenchman, Doug Letourneau, had been uh, monitoring the FM radio frequencies. He picked up the NVA talking. He turned it over to his interpreter. And the interpreter <clears throat> heard the NVA planning the ambush had we gone to the northeast. As so that's a classic example of them wanting us to go one way so they could walk us into an ambush. Now, fortunately, the uh, Captain Tuong and his, his King B, the H-34 came in and rescued us at the late, last minute. So we survived that ordeal on Christmas 68. I guess um, the, you know, the, the NVA were, were a clever enemy. Oh, absolutely. Clever, dedicated, I mean, Lynn Black on October 6th, us on October 7th of 68, they killed so many NVA soldiers, they had wave after wave attack. And Lynn was on more level ground and they just stacked up the dead NVA bodies and used the dead bodies as a protective wall against the next wave that came at them. In our case, we were on top of a small hill and they kept coming up the hill at us from two sides and we killed, we killed them as they came out of the jungle and blew them back and blew them back. 
at one point, Don Wolken said to me, he said, look, do you see what they're doing? Well, I couldn't see it at first, but then he goes, look here. And he explained what it was. And they were stacking up the dead bodies on the hilltop. So on the back side, they were stacking the dead bodies because they wanted to get an angle to shoot down at us. And they were stacking up their dead comrades to do that. So that gives you a sense of the ferocity of the uh, North Vietnamese army soldier. I mean, you've said this before and, and other sort of guys have said it, but uh, it was pretty much a suicide mission, what you were doing. <laughs> well, we never thought about it that way, but with the brilliance of hindsight, uh, there were times we, we it felt like that, particularly in light of just how compromised we were. And again, we didn't realize that until long after the war ended in, um, on April 30th, 1975. But there was extensive compromise and we could talk about that a little later or at any point you want. You must have known from, from the recon club learning lessons before you even went out. But, even, but as soon as you had done your first mission, you know, just what the stakes were, what you were up against. Oh yeah, and again, when I get there in May of 68, by that time, there were several recon teams totally wiped out. And there was another team, uh, ST Alaska. Everybody was killed except the one zero, John Allen, who E and E'd for a couple of days. And fortunately he was able to come back to camp. Um, another team, team got out, but the one zero was still on the ground and that we lost him. And uh, Johnny Calhoun was the, uh, was the one zero. So on March 27th, ST Asp was wiped out. Next day, we lost Johnny Calhoun. And, be, and then in May of 68, this is the same month where Roy Benavides earned a Medal of Honor down at CCS. Um, they had a recon team was in Cambodia and they were a deep kimchi, deep. And Roy went in uh, as a medic because he knew some of the team members there. And um, that's just, that was just part of May. We had, uh, um, we had original FOB one was Camp Duck and that had been a training site. And there was an A camp there when we moved our SOG operations up to Fubai, Da Nang was the headquarters area. Camp Duck got overrun. And there's a book out called BAIT, B-A-I-T. And it's just a brilliant book about how the men who were there, and it's one of the most thoroughly researched books I've ever read on Vietnam. But they talked about being BAIT and Westmoreland wanted to kill as many NVA soldiers as possible and use Camp Duck. And uh, the NVA hit the camp, assuming that the monsoons would rain heavy and would give them cover and they wouldn't have to worry about air cover, but mother nature cooperated with the Green Berets that for two days and they had air cover and they killed thousands of NVA soldiers there, but they eventually had to give it up. And uh, again, this is all 68. This is before we even get through halfway through the year. And so they were ferocious and tenacious. And um, you know, earlier in 65 and 66, we had three more A camps that had been in the Ashaw Valley. All were wiped out. And of course, Benny Atkins uh, earned his Medal of Honor many years later from his actions at one of the A camps in the Ashaw. The thing that really strikes me and, and you know, is about the SOG operations is, is you know every time you get on that helicopter what the risks are and yet you still go. You still go out every, every day or every week when you get called for a mission. And, but there were guys that would volunteer off and say, you know, I've done enough. I, oh, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. Well, yeah. And, you know, um, well, like in my case with Idaho, um, uh, Spike Team Idaho, after the mission in Echo 4, Don Wolken was the 1-0. He got promoted to being a Cubby rider, which Cubby was our fact, forward air controller. And the Air Force had a pilot in an O-2. And then we had a Green Beret. 
who would be the rider. And the cubby rider would do the actual combo with the team on the ground. So they were experienced, they knew what we were up against, and we had common language, common knowledge, and we could go to them for experience, for options. They would help us find LZs as well as, more importantly, direct TAC air. And uh, that was just an invaluable tool. So Don got promoted. I became the one zero and Jim Davison was on the team. And he came up to me a few days later and said, brother, I can't do this. And he had had one year tour of duty with the 173rd, saw severe combat with them. And he told me, he said, you know, I've never seen anything like this, what you and I did in Laos. And I thanked him. I thanked him for being honest. He couldn't do it. And it would be better to have him say it that way. And with SOG, anybody running recon was all volunteers. Now, some guys said they were volunteered by commanding officers. I'm not familiar with that side of it. But at any point, when you said, I don't want to be on a team, you could get off. So Jim got off. We got him a new assignment. And um, you had to respect that as opposed to what Lynn Black had on October 5th. We had an American who was the son of some rinky-dink general somewhere who fired not one round all day. And he had his face in the ground and was uh, praying, which was nice. And I guess maybe that helped, but uh, he could have used an extra gun. I guess uh, it really sorts out the men from the boys to running, running an operation like that. <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, it, it definitely was a test. You never knew how they're going to hit you, but you knew they were going to hit you. And um, you just hoped that you had, at some point, you would get tack air or at least get the king bees in to get you out. And, yeah. and that would be the game for you. First, you, foremost, you would try to accomplish the mission. That yeah. was always primary with us. And, uh, and any majority of the one zeros would say that. And we took pride in trying and we were up against extreme odds, but um, that's what we signed up for. We didn't realize just how extreme the odds were but you, you definitely wanted to get the mission accomplished and it would get frustrating. You know, I mean, there are days when in the morning we would go in, it's November of 68. And then early part of December, you go in, get shot out of a primary, secondary and alternate LZ. Go back to base, have lunch, get a new target, go back and do it again. Get shot out, primary, secondary, alternate. On one occasion, as the King Bee was dis descending into the LZ, somehow the indig indigenous team member, either Sal or Fook, had observed a wire across the LZ. Now, how he saw it, I'll never know. But he communicated to the door gunner to abort the going into the LZ. And he pulled away, and Covey came back, and they directed air assets on that LZ. And it turned out the, the wire was attached to a 500 pound bomb. So A, they knew we were coming. B, they had time to put in a 500 pound bomb that did not ignite when the Air Force had dropped it. But they rigged it so that had we hit that trip wire, we would have been obliterated right there by one of our 500 pound bombs and we would have been fertilizer in Leos. Yeah, and I guess that kind of explains a lot about some of the, you know, you, you had, what was it, 12 whole teams go missing? Yeah, I prefer to run six men. Occasionally we'd run eight. And mm -hmm. on one special mission, we went in heavy with, um, we went in with 10, we were gonna go with 10, um, but, the reason why I preferred six was um, when you're engaged in this heavy combat, one helicopter usually could get six men out. Because by the time we were extracted, we fired all our ammo, majority of our hand grenades. So a lot of the weight from the weapons, I mean, from the ammo, hand grenades, and the rounds for our M79 would be used up. So we could usually get out on one helicopter, which we did a few times. Well, more than once, of course. What, sure. Can you explain a little bit about what what was 
a recon team or a spike team and kind of how was that different from a hatchet force that you might see? Yeah, um, the recon teams were small teams. So it would be specifically their missions were re recon, general reconnaissance. And the missions varied everything from a general recon to a target area, area recon and um, a POW snatch, wiretaps. Um, and then of course, uh, bomb damage assessments. We had to do those BDAs and uh, try to do prisoner snatches. And then of course the bright lights, which were the most dangerous of all. Um, so the recon teams were smaller and each team would generally have two or three Americans and then nine or 10 indigenous troops, which could vary from, in my case, I was very fortunate to have South Vietnamese, three of whom had migrated uh, from North Vietnam in 1954 with their families. Because in 54, they were allowed families to come south after mm -hmm. Dien Bien Phu, where the North Vietnamese conquered the French and, and the French left and the families came south. So I had on Idaho, when I came on a team, Spider Parks was the one zero, Don Wolken was the one one, the assistant team leader, and I was the one two, the radio operator. And then we hired uh, more team members because uh, to recover, to replace the Vietnamese that had been wiped out on that mission. And then a hatchet force would be a company size operation. And they would run operations like a slam mission or um, in 1969, Eldon Bardwell was on a target. In fact, the mission where Eldon got shot in the chest by an NVA and lived to talk about it. Um, Eldon went into a target that had basically NVA stay behinds and it was a major way station. And when Eldon went in, they were on the ground for a couple of hours, had minor contact and they just got into the command bunker and they had a wealth of information. And Eldon being a great soldier that he was, he wanted a POW, he saw a guy and he chased this guy and the guy runs into a tunnel and Eldon kept chasing him. And as this guy went down the tunnel, there was a hole in the wall. This guy jumped through the hole and Eldon continued to chase. Now, fortunately for Eldon, Earlier, when he was on the ground, he picked up an NVA vest where you had a vest, you put it over your head and it hung in front of you and it had three NVA magazines for the AK-47. Well, Elton was wearing that. And when he jumped into the hole, there was another NVA there and shot him in the chest. Fortunately, the round hit the magazine and lost the energy but it knocked Eldon, literally knocked him on his ass. And uh, that night when Eldon came back, he came to our hooch and told, talking to Lynn and I, he goes, you know, I thought I was dead. I mean, but then I get it. Wait a minute. I said, if I'm thinking, therefore I must be alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So he came back, his recon team came out the next day, mad dog Shriver went in with his hatchet force and he went in with, I think it was only a platoon, a smaller size element. And they took out one or two helicopters worth of intelligence reports, maps, equipment, and a bunch of other uh, information that they got from the site, as well as destroying food and weapons and ammo caches. And it was one of just another amazing mission. And then just a little quick sidebar on Eldon, two days after that mission, he and the Frenchman went on R&R &R to Hawaii and Eldon met his first son in Hawaii, two days after uh, he should have been dead, but uh, just, it wasn't his day. Wow. Yeah, just amazing story. So, and, they, and um, hatchet forces would go out into, into an area target sometimes trying to uh, back up the troops, like we said, on the uh, SLAM missions. And then the, probably one of, if not the most successful hatchet force stories would be Operation Tailwind, 
which was September 11th through the 14th in Laos by a hatchet force that had 16 Green Berets and 120 indigenous troops. And uh, that mission was west of the normal Prairie Fire AO because the CIA was involved in a major battle with their secret war. And they had 5,000 troops that were up against the NVA and they were getting hurt. And they asked Saad to come in to take the pressure off of that attack. And um, Captain Gene McCarley was the uh, team leader. And they went in on the ground. And when they were getting inserted, well, first of all, because the mission was further west, they used Marine Corps CH-53 Deltas, which were the, at that time the biggest helicopter in the uh, US military. And um, they used three helicopters to insert the uh, the entire force of that hatchet force and when the last helicopter was going in two or three of the indigenous troops were wounded on the way into the lz now ordinarily if like a, for a recon team if we see an enemy soldier on the lz we're compromised or if we get shot at we're really compromised and we're going home to try again tomorrow the hatchet force they got shot at had casualties on the helicopters landed and got on the ground and proceeded to kick ass and took numbers. They had been on the ground for two or three hours. They came to a major cache and they had a lot of intel reports. And while they were there, the phone rang. There was an NVA phone that rang and one of the Green Berets picked it up and said, hello, 5th Special Forces Group, may I help you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they got as much intel out of there and then they came in and napalmed it and they destroyed um, a lot of ammunition, tons of uh, food. And then two days later or three days later, I forget if it's two or three days later, they came across another major command center. And again, they got key and uh, documents out of that. But on the first night, the command post where Gene McCarley was there with uh, Gary Mike Rose, who was the medic, and several other the team leaders, and because the hatchet force would be broken down with platoons, and each platoon would have a team leader, and then each platoon would have squad members that were in charge of their squads. And um, they were in a meeting, and an RPG came in, and it went past everybody and exploded, and it hit a tree, and the shrapnel came back, and it wounded several of them. And Mike Rose, to this day, his left hand, he cannot do certain things with his fingers because of shrapnel wounds that he suffered. And Mike had to use his car 15 as a crutch as he marched through with the team for the next four days of the mission. He was wounded. His foot had been severely uh, uh, wounded, injured, and he... Uh, went down and used a bandage, an ace bandage to just tie up his jungle boot, which had been torn open. And he had a, a foot wound, but he just taped it over and continued to march on that lame foot. And he had two or three indigenous troops that were seriously injured. And they put together improvised car uh, um, carry, like they would use a poncho liner to use that to carry their, their, their wounded comrades. And they moved every night, and every day. They had intense firefights. They had uh, specters at night. And then finally on the fourth day, they were planning to go at least one more day, but the weather closed in and Covey told them about a massive NVA force that was coming to engage them. And they were about to be overrun when an A-1 Sky Raider pilot named Tom Stump was able to break through the clouds and talk directly to Gene McCarley and was able to do gun runs that broke the back of that particular assault, saving the hatchet force. And then uh, they got distracted later in the day. First helicopter left, took some gunfire. The second helicopter left with much more gunfire from the enemy. The third helicopter came in 
And that was where Gene McCarley, Mike Rose, several other team members, they were all together. And they would go out, get on a helicopter. As they're taken off, they got hammered. <laughs> and um, they were flying, leaving the LZ. One of the two engines went out. <laughs> so they loaded. And then the uh, Marine door gunner got shot in the neck. And his blood was spurting out. Mike Rose went over and saved his life. And there was a young Marine. And he thought he was going to die. And Mike said, look, if you were going to die, you would have been dead a minute ago. You're not going to die. Settle down. I'm going to save you. He passed him up and the Marine lived through that mission. They got up. They went over another mountaintop. The second engine went out. And then the helicopter auto-rotated in impacted so hard that uh, Gene McCarley's teeth were crushed. And he had to work two years to get his mouth rebuilt from that crash. And uh, of course, on uh, October 23rd, 2017, Mike Rose, who was the only medic, got the Medal of Honor from uh, President Trump on that mission. So that would be a typical, but a most successful uh, mission for a hatchet force. It's always extraordinary circumstances. And I think that, you know, the types of people who thrive in those types of environments are extraordinary people. So thank you. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. And, and Gene McCarley uh, was the, he came up with the whole strategy to keep them moving. So the NVA could never mass on one spot, but by the fourth day, they, they had enough, I mean, they were coming at him with over a thousand troops just to, to, to go after them because they knew that we heard him. And that second cache, again, they destroyed tons of food, tons of ammunition, and they got intel reports that they brought back, as well as some um, NVA money, which they turned over all turned it over to S2, the intel people. Mm. So uh, could you tell us maybe so? Your spike team, um, spike team Idaho. You know, you, you had both Americans and Indigenous on that on that team, and uh, what what kinds of traits were common among uh, those people? You know, what what made your team what it was? Well, you know, this is the the one thing about it, our people. They were South Vietnamese, mm-hmm. and the South Vietnamese on my team knew that their government was corrupt, but they preferred a corrupt government they knew and could live with to communism. Sure. And that is one perspective that I never forgot. And they were willing to die fighting communism. And uh, so a common trait there would be you know, the Green Beret motto is De Oppresso Liber, to free the oppressed. And in this case, we were there helping them to avoid being oppressed by the communists. And um, they, over time, um, they proved to be valiant soldiers. I mean, when I came on the team, Sal, and who was the Vietnamese team leader, the counterpart, um, had been running missions for two and a half years. Hep, the interpreter, had been running for over two years. And they had been across the fence numerous times. And they survived it all. So I had to earn my spurs and earn their respect on the team. And uh, it took us, we trained hard with Spider Parks for the first couple of months in between the monsoons and everything else. And then we did some... Uh, in-country ambushes. We had a couple of, of uh, practice missions on the east side of the Ashaw Valley. And then we started running hard targets. We inserted Air Force sensors along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and along Highway 9 up by uh, Quezon after they had closed down the Marine Corps base at Quezon. And we had FOB3 uh, there with the Marines, which nobody talks about much, but we were there. And um, so that uh, and each mission, you know, our, we just affectionately call them our little people, because in my case, I was a head and shoulders taller than most of them, but they were fearless. I'm alive today, 
thanks to their um, combat acumen and the fact that they never folded against direct assaults. And, you know, back in base, we had our fun, we had poker and uh, we tried to take care of each other back in the base. But when it came time to go to work, they did it. They're completely fearless. And Sal, he had done it so long, he could smell the enemy. And after a while, I got to really respect that. And when Sal's eyes got bigger, the bigger his eyes got, then that would be more NVA that he could anticipate coming for us. And, um, you know, and, and when I first came on the team, you know, Sal looked at me and he turned to Hep and goes, uh, he's too big, his feet are too big, he's too tall, and he looks stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to earn my way to get their respect. And it took a while. It took a while. But after the Echo 4 target, um, we were, uh, I earned that respect from Sal. And then when Don Wolken got promoted, uh, we talked about who would be the team leader. And because of the bad experience that Lynn Black had with a, 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 a team leader who came in with no experience and no ability to listen, um, I became the one zero and just very fortunate to have good little people on the team because I learned from them and in the jungle, they ran point and they would be on a tail and covering our tracks and, uh, in the jungle, we just listened to them because they knew a lot more, their instincts were better. And of course, like I said, I mean, what more could you ask for a team member that could smell the enemy? Yeah, that's 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 so awesome that you you know developed that kind of relationship with those guys. Yeah, and put we that had kind of trust indigenous them. personnel. Like in my case, I had South Vietnamese. You had Chinese nuns that were a Chinese population that had lived in Vietnam and the Saigon outside the Saigon area for years, and they were just incredible warriors. And then you had the Montagnards, that were the tribes people, and they were a lot more primitive. They couldn't throw a hand grenade worth of shit, but uh, they hated all Vietnamese. So our job was to keep them focused on the North Vietnamese. And that, <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the little challenges back in camp. But uh, when it came time to, uh, to do battle, they would be there and they were just completely fearless. And a lot of those guys didn't they end up actually eventually moving over to the States, some of them. Not, I, you know, some guys have, um, there's more King Bee pilots and, yeah. uh, some of our people came over like Cowboy who, um, uh, Khan Doan, who was with Lynn Black on October the 5th. And he was also with the Frenchman the day the Frenchman got shot in the back four times on his first mission by the NVA. The bullets went through his radio, went through his rucksack, went through his fatigue jacket, went through his undershirt. And ran out of energy, but after it, it poked holes, four holes in his back. <laughs> and uh, Cowboy was with Doug on that mission. And that was where Doug uh, killed the tracking dog. And um, they're just incredible people. Um, you know, there are some problems, but that just comes with the territory. We had some Green Berets that were problematic. But the, um, the guys would continue on with the mission and do the best they could. Can you tell us a little bit about life uh, on the FOB, on FOB-1, um, while you were back at, uh, at camp? Yeah, um, it was, in our case, uh, particularly when I got on a team, um, there'd be a morning formation, breakfast, <clears throat> and then training. And Spider trained us hard because we, had, we hired a new people, and I was green. And uh, Wolken had been in camp for a while. So we did everything from repelling to practicing helicopters, just getting on and off the helicopters with the, with the King Bees because they only had one door on the, on the right-hand side of the helicopter. And, but practicing going in, practicing with Hueys, and then practicing rope extractions from the LZs and patrolling. And... I mean, we, we spent thousands of rounds of ammunition doing our contingency drills so that if we're on a line of march and then we got hit, then we would fold back 
And there'd be one guy would fire, next guy would come back and reload as we backed up. Uh, unlike the ranger tactics at the time, which were to attack an ambush, our job was we always try to continue the mission. And you didn't know how many people up there were going to be ambushing you. Fortunately, because of the skill of our indigenous troops, Sal, Fook, Sung later, who was trained up to be a point man for us, we were never ambushed because of the tactics we did. And uh, we were just fortunate where other teams were not so fortunate. And uh, uh, they were just, uh, so we had that training aspect. It was the top part of the day. Train in the morning, afternoon, do weapons cleaning, talk about other tactics, talk about training on the wiretaps. And eventually, um, HEP was even going so far as training a couple of the South Vietnamese that were really good, proficient with English. And HEP was training them up so that as time went on, if anything happened to me or any of the Americans, we, the South Vietnamese would be able to get on the radio, make comma with Covey, and then also direct airstrikes. And that's how we trained, we cross-trained. And uh, so in the morning there'd be the training. If you had a mission, then in the early days of 68, we were doing visual reconnaissance. So if we had a target like with Echo 4, Don Wolken, who was the team leader, flew out, did a visual reconnaissance, picked the LZs, uh, primary, secondary, and an alternate LZ. And um, then that night, we'd have a full inspection. Don and I would inspect the team. He would inspect me. I would check his gear. And then we checked Jim Davison, who was a new member of the team at that time. And, uh, and then first light in the morning, we got up. And that's the picture that's on the cover of Across the Fence. It's the only picture we ever took before a mission because Hep, Sal, and Fook, who were in the front of that picture, were pissed and superstitious. They hated taking pictures. They felt they would take a picture before a mission, it would be, it would be bad kimchi for you. And as it turned out, we had that firefight for four hours that uh, we were very fortunate to survive. And thanks to Captain Tin, who came in and hovered 10 minutes to pull us out. And that's the way it went. If we had targets, um, by November, we had lost so many teams either to illness or being wiped out or some casualties on the teams. They were in the middle of training up. Uh, our team was the only team operational. So we had a morning, we'd go out, fly, get shot out of the primary, secondary, all to come back, have lunch and go fly for another target, try to get a team on the ground just to try to, to see what the enemy was up to. And um, that would be the de rigueur. Um, Cause 68 was very intense and early part of 69, things slowed down a little bit and then they closed that for B1. Our recon team went to Da Nang, which then became CCN. And there it was a little bit more relaxed. There were more recon teams, but we still kept up an active pace. We trained at night, we'd play volleyball. They had a volleyball net down there in the sand. And um, once in a while, we'd have a little get together with the team. Um, I'd have some extra money from poker. So we'd buy some extra chow and just have a team night and uh, just get to know each other better. And then during my second tour of duty, I got to the point where I ate in the indigenous mess hall with the team at night, because I really liked the, uh, their chow, kept me close to the team. We had a couple of new team members that came in and one was Doti Kwong, who had been with Lynn Black on October 5th and 68. And he was just an incredible soldier. So um, that was our life, it was training, and then weapons, inspections within our cells, <clears throat> talking about what the other missions would be. And then of course, when we had a target, we would review the map with Sal because he's so familiar with Laos particularly that uh, we always valued his opinion and we'd get any uh, suggestions from him for weapons or any other tactics or things like that. Yeah, that's, that's that kind of state of, of constant readiness and it seems like one hell of an op tempo for 
you know, Spike Team Idaho to be constantly out there doing that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, you know, people don't realize what just being in a helicopter, your adrenaline's pumping, you're going to a target. That can wear you out. And some of the little people on our team, I rotated people because uh, after doing that for two or three days in a row, um, it, it, it wore on you. So by November, it was just Bubba and I, we took Henry King with us on one mission and, um, and then we would rotate some of the South Vietnamese, but by that point, they were trained up. So, and again, we did all this and talking with Sal, who was our counterpart. And he would pick who would be going on a mission with us. And uh, um, it was just teamwork to, to the highest level. And, um, you know, if a team member had, a, had somebody in the family who was ill or something like that, we'd get him passes. And of course, whenever we could, we'd get him passes on the, for an overnight pass in town. And if the weekend came, if we had a down day, um, either for the, for monsoon season or things like that, we give them extra passes to go home. And we'd worked with them. And, um, you know, it, it, it really had teamwork. So when I, when I, when it was time for me to go home after my first tour of duty, I landed in April 68, went home in April, at the end of April 69, around about the 28th, 29th. And um, I felt guilty as hell. I hated to leave the team, but that was the procedure Then you had a one year tour of duty you could extend. And at the time I had a, uh, had a girlfriend that I was pretty close to. So I went back home and then uh, that fell apart over time. And then I was at Fort Devens, which I hated, which was 10th group at the time. And um, I went to the Pentagon, got my orders written up to go back to Vietnam, specifically the CCN. When I got back, I got back on the team with uh, Lynn Black was the uh, one zero. When I left, Lynn took over the team, did a great job. And he and a freshman ran a, a shitload of missions and including some really hairy bright lights, um, amazing bright lights. And um, they lived to talk about it. So Lynn and I took turns for a couple of missions. He'd be the one zero. Then I was the one zero. And finally, uh, the sergeant major goes, hey, you two guys got too much experience. Lynn, you're out of here. So they gave him a new assignment that uh, took him away from the team. And then John Engels came on the team and I was the one zero again, up until April of uh, 1970. I have to say, Tilt, that um, I think it was, it was Lynn Black's book, uh, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, that really got, I think it was the first SOG book I read. And I got to the end <laughs> of it. I got to the end of it and I literally, started again on page one and read it again you know his, oh yeah his experiences on the on on the team that he puts down in that book um which you went into in the uh, in the jocko podcast uh you know people could listen to it there um or get the book um and it just blew my mind that pe that, that that people could get into that kind of battle and live oh yeah and when he talked about that particular battle on october 5th 1968 there's a couple times where his mindset, the way he reflected on that, oh my God, it's just so gripping. And I, I'm with you. I, I'm guilty of rereading it after I read it because it was, well, I'm biased because me and Spider are in there a little bit along with Hep and the boys, but uh, God, what an amazing book. You know, what's, what's sad is that he threw out, he told me he threw out three to 500 pages extra copy from that book. I said, oh, Lynn, just give it to me. I'll work on it with you or something like that. said, no, no, it's gone. Yeah. Oh, no. <sighs> Pride. Well, it's a bit like trying to write this game with you guys. You know, we're only scratching the surface. You know, we, we, we come up with a few missions um, uh, which you guys have helped us to design and shape and structure. But, uh, you know, you get to the end of all that and, and we've barely touched the SOG experience. You know, there's still so much more uh, to go into. Well, yeah. And, and I've, you know, I got my first three books out and I've only scratched the surface and there are other guys that have done, I mean, you have Nick Brockhausen who did We Few mm -hmm. and that book, it's stream of consciousness at such a sophisticated level. 
it's like Lynn Black from the stream of consciousness approach. Now, Nick is just so bright. He pulled it off with a phenomenal way because you got a sense of what they're up against and a sense of what a complete crazy man he is. <laughs> yes. But, you know, it was just one of those books where it's just phenomenal. And then you have straight history. John Plaster was the godfather of SOG authors. He did the first nonfiction. Dave Maurer's The Dying Place. That first page will just grip you and just take you into the book. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Uncommon Valor. Mm -hmm. And those were mostly contoum stories. But we're talking about Franklin, uh, Freddie Zabotowski, incredible missions those guys ran. You know, and I've told people that um, if we had a recon Richter scale, zero being the lowest and 10 being the most severe target or mission, mission experience, I put myself at a five, maybe a six on an Echo 4 and a couple of targets. But compared to Fred Zabotowski, the men that earned the Medal of Honor, Lynn Black's mission. And you know, there's a guy named Dick Thompson who um, on one mission, he's probably going on r and &R, He winds up on a helicopter without his weapon. He repels into a target, runs out of rope. His hands are bloody because he had no gloves to repel down the rope. He lets go, falls into the jungle, breaks two or three ribs, gets to the ground and got the mission done on a bright light. It's like, I felt like a wimp compared to Dick. And that was like, that's clearly right up there. That's gotta be 10 plus for a man to do that, but he did it. Yeah, there's, there, there needs to be a lot of SOG movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, well, we're talking about Holly Weird here. Forget about it. They, uh, the games you gotta play, they even, get a, they even have people look at your story. Uh, I got gray hair from all that. So I, oh, I give it up on Holly weird. One we'll settle for the books, the podcast, a good, a good game. And we'll get that first video game out. And maybe they'll give us ground to come back for a second one after you sell a couple of those games, you know? Yeah, let's hope so. That's the plan. Um, can I ask you about weapons tilt? So, so Please. your personal weapons on recon and, unusual choices sometimes and, and <laughs> any mistakes you made by, you know, taking the wrong weapon along or, you know, the, Oh the no, my, it, it, my, my, my weapon tree was very fundamental. The car 15, which I loved. I had it um, throughout my first tour. When I came back from my second tour of duty, the <laughs> S4 um, gave me a brand new car 15. It was literally still wrapped on all, all the aluminum had the other stuff inside, a little bit of the Vaseline or whatever, whatever the uh, lubricant was. And I took it down to the range. It was perfectly zero. So I just put a, put a, a cravat on it because the cravat was quiet for my uh, strap and uh, carried a car 15 at all times, 20 round magazines with 18 rounds in each. We carried 600 plus rounds for it. Had the sawed off M79. So when we were on patrol, we would have, at least I had, ball bearings in the round for the M79. So we had to break contact, or if I was in between magazines, I could fire that. It would stop anything. I mean, anything coming at us within 20, 30 feet. And then we had the HE rounds for that. So we carried 10 to 12 rounds of HE for the M79. Always had one tear gas round and then one um, thermite round for it, in case we needed to burn to get a, a hard target. And then hand grenades, uh, again, 10 to 12 hand grenades. And uh, a few occasions I took the 22, the standard 22 silenced for dogs, but uh, the trackers didn't get close enough to us on, on those missions that I had the opportunity to use it like Doug did. and. Uh, um, that's it for me. Um, we experimented back at base. We, we had a lot of different weapons that came through. The stoner system came through, but the whole weapons purchasing process by 68 was so geared to the car 15 and the M79 that uh, they just didn't transfer over to stoner. We had experimental weapons like the rocket, uh, had a little rocket 
I forget what the caliber of it was, but um, we tried those. We had a pump M79. Henry King carried out on one mission with us. And it's just incredible firepower to think you could fire off five, um, you know, M, you know, the, the uh, M79 rounds, the 40 millimeter rounds, mm-hmm. high explosive. You go, it was like a big shotgun. Fire around, jack new round, five times. The only trouble was occasionally the um, feeding lid would jam. But uh, on that mission, when we were getting extracted, the NVA came at us hard and Henry King just tore them up with that M79, the pump M79. So those are my weapons. Um, We trained on everything. We of course trained on all the uh, communist weapons, everything from World War II stuff, which I can't remember, to AKs, to the SKS, so that like with Lynn Black, when they ran out of ammo for the car 15s, they picked up the AK 47s from the dead soldiers and took their ammo. That was the way they got through the battle. They were able to survive using enemy weapons and uh, ammo. Uh, so we trained on all of that. And of course, we had the Swedish K, the grease gun, the uh, Uzis. The Uzis, we had both the uh, nine millimeter and the 45 caliber versions. And this would be all part of our training. Go down to the range with them. M60, we had the laws. Only carried laws on a few occasions when we were anticipating coming up against tanks or enemy trucking of some sort. And then um, what else? Of course, the Claymore mines. We worked with the Claymores from the traditional clacker. There would be, I think it was a 50-foot cable so you could clack it off and then we had fuses. So sometimes if we're doing escape and evasion or if the enemy was coming at us hard, we put a claymore in with a five, 10, 15 minute, 15 second fuse. And uh, that would slow them down. That would give us a few seconds of time to get more distance between us and the enemy. Did you, did you go in uh, with RPDs as well? I did not. Others did. Um, I think Nick Brockhausen did and a few other guys that were on Nick's team. At one point, I think Nick and one of his teammates both had RPDs because a lot of the recon teams began carrying RPDs or M60s because it, they just needed the extra firepower, that sustained firepower from a machine gun. Um, I thought about it. And we were, uh, if we did it, we would have cut the barrel down and trimmed it to make it as tight as, as possible. And because um, you can really eat up a lot of rounds with a machine gun and uh, you need fire control discipline with it. But it was a great weapon. Uh, we all liked the RPD better than the M60, actually. I don't know if you saw it. We posted it last night um, on our Zoom group, but Sam was, was, uh, running uh, Oscar 8 with us in the game uh, <laughs> last last Friday night after we'd had a few beers and he was rocking a, a sawn off RPD and a sawn off M79 and keeping us alive because uh, you know you got to put the weight of fire down to, to, keep, oh, yeah. to keep your perimeter you know it was we were literally being sandwiched from both sides well three or four sides all coming in and, and he was put, doing a, an amazing job of just Pulling so much lead out with that RPD, and, and wow. Ken, Ken watched it this morning, and it's his RPD that's in the game. Was um, that right? Yeah, yeah, and he watched it and thought it was tremendous. Well, you know, when Eldon Bargewell earned his Distinguished Service Cross on his second tour of duty at CCN, he had been shot in the face, so he had a severe face wound, and the team needed cover fire, and Eldon provided cover fire with his RPD. And the RPD, he said, if he didn't have an RPD, he would not have gotten out of there alive because it enabled him to put down the fire base so the team could get to the chopper. And then it gave him enough firepower so that they had to keep their heads down long enough for him to get out. Hmm. So, yeah, the RPD was just an amazing weapon. And I think Eldon passed his RPD on to Ken 
at Fob One when Ken was rotating in and, and Eldon was going home. Oh, is so, that right? Yeah, Why so didn't Ken, know that? Ken, Ken yeah. finished up with Eldon's RPD. And, wow, well, just for your audience who don't know, both uh, Ken Bore and Eldon Bargewell uh, were in SOG, and Ken was the last American 1 0 of RT Idaho. And then Eldon and Ken both stayed in. They both served for close to 40 years. And they both retired as two-star generals, major generals, extraordinary careers, dedicating their lives to our country. Just amazing men, both. Yeah, and we're very uh, amazingly privileged to have Ken with us on the team. Uh, oh, yeah, the absolutely. There's, I don't think there's many games that get a two-star that come along and give, <laughs> give advice and support to, you know. Um, we're very, very, very honoured. Well, you came up with some amazing stuff that you all have incorporated into the game, so I've, I can't wait to see the game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was commenting this morning on because um, Sam was using his compass, his wrist compass, uh, which we modelled for the game. And, you know, we modelled his, uh, his custom high-power um, pistol and, and a few other bits and pieces. And, and Sam was actually wearing your gloves in the game the, the other day, which we modelled from you. So, that, that, you know, when you look around at all the guys in the game, you'll see all different bits and pieces of your kit that's been, that we've actually recreated and, and put onto the soldiers. Oh, well, outstanding. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and well, thank you, because that's a game, your game, the way you're approaching it is more realistic. It's about SOG, so I'm biased because uh, th to get our stories out, I appreciate that. But more <laughs> importantly, your people in the games, they'll be firing car 15s and machine guns but they'll reload their guns like the real world <laughs> unlike other video games where people fire a thousand rounds and never reload and they get killed a thousand times and they never die whereas in your game there's going to be a little bit more realistic oh oh yeah on on the just watching sam on his on his uh his recording this morning you know he's he's diving into a shell hole <laughs> into, a, into a crater just so he can reload his RPD because it takes such a long time to reload. <laughs> you know. Was it the drum or belt fed? It was drum. Went yeah, black that, on ammo that, several times. Yeah, when you're doing that under enemy fire, that could be a little challenging. Yeah, yeah I think uh, it's what about seven seconds to reload it or something. I mean, it must feel like a half an hour when you're doing it. An eternity. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's there's a really good moment in that, and we'll we'll put that up on YouTube for people to watch where Sam needs to reload, and then all of a sudden another team member appears on his right side and he's also got an RPD. And so he, so he takes a knee and starts reloading, and the other guy steps in and is hosing all the bushes. And wow. Two, two RPDs on one team is 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 an outstanding firepower. It's a lot of firepower. We had times when we would be rotating on a car 15, but that'd be a quicker rotation, believe me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, okay, so we covered weapons pretty well. Um, and what what about the uh, what about the enemy? What were they generally carrying and shooting at you? In in um, in the beginning of '68, there were still a lot of SKSs, but they uh, the NVA, uh, over time, by the time any NVA we contacted, the majority had AK-47s, the, the universal communist weapon that um, came from Russia, China, Czechoslovakia, the communist bloc, the communist bloc countries that provided the weapons to, in support of North Vietnam against us. And I mean, we've seen quite a few weapons from, you know, Ken's photos as well as bring back some things. Um, and it is, you know, generally all, it comes from all different countries as well. I think the Czech Republic and, um, and Poland and, you know, Hungary. So it's all the different, slightly different variants that the gun nuts like, like to see, you know. Uh, oh yeah. I mean, we saw different <clears throat> versions of the AK. Um, and, uh, but, you know, when you're on the receiving end of it, you can't tell if it's an AK with a classable stock or what, but you could tell it's an AK. Had that bark that's distinctive in the green tracers, you know. So talking a little bit about team tactics, um, you know, you in your book, you talk a lot about all the drills that you practice and whatnot. What, you know, obviously you spent a lot of time perfecting that, but what, you know, 
what was it like to try and pull that out while you're actually in contact? You know, when, when shit starts hitting the fan, what, what happened to your team tactics? Well, um, all the training just kicked in. So you didn't think about it. That was the key. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. like, for example, when there's an initial firefight in those opening seconds, the milliseconds, the most critical thing is to gain fire superiority. So between Sal and us and, and our other team members, every time that we had the initial firefight, we gained fire superiority because of the quick magazine change and being able to get on front of that with the enemy, no matter who they were or where they were. In our case, we were very fortunate. We were able to gain fire superiority. And then as time went on, they would come at us, but we had pushed them back strong enough initially. And um, in those opening seconds, I mean, you know, a car 15, you fire 20 rounds in a second and a half. Mere mortal men may not be under, understand or appreciate that, but think about 20 rounds going out in a second and a half. Then you change your magazine and come back and do it again. And our car 15 was designed so that the magazine release and then the release for the, um, for the um, action to go forward with a new magazine, it was so much quicker than the AK. The AK was perhaps more rugged, but I never had a malfunction in my car 15. I was very fortunate. Um, and none of our guys in the field ever had a car 15 malfunction. But in those initial seconds, uh, Sam, that was the critical element, was getting fire superiority. And to, due to design a weapon and our training with it, we were able to stay on top of it. And every time they came at us, we were able to blow them back in the woods, either through hand grenades, claymores, full automatic. And then once you got down to it, you try to shoot and keep the, you know as many rounds as possible to keep it so you would have weapons to sustain during the battle. Cause sometimes we'd be engaged with the enemy two or three hours before we had uh, any combo, before we get tack air over us. It's absolutely critical that you do that. You know, you gotta keep the pressure on them. Otherwise there's no, you know, there's, there's the odds are so stacked against you that that must be just completely necessary. Oh yeah, this is, this is not a football game. If yeah. you mistake here, you're dead. Mm. And there are teams that made mistakes or teams that just got overrun because the NVA would just would wave after wave. And um, this is one aspect of the, of the combat from Saab where um, I don't think the average citizen would ever understand that, that there would be people willing to die to kill us. And they would come, they would keep coming. I mean, look at what Lynn Black did. What was the team dynamic, you know, when, when contact was likely, you know, the, the certain times when you could, I know you talk about in your book, sometimes you could hear the dogs, you could hear, you know, that, that they were out there and, and what, what kind of, first of all, what was that like when that happened? And then what kicked things off? Like what uh, usually was initiation of contact? Well, uh, with the dogs and then the trackers. Sometimes mm -hmm. the trackers would try to push us in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was always a guessing game as to what they were trying to do. And um, of course, when the trackers got closer, then you realized that uh, it was going to be more difficult to complete the mission. And you go from uh, trying to do the mission to survival mode because it was better to survive and come back and fight another day than to get wiped out trying to accomplish a mission. Um, and uh, so in the beginning part of it, like if you heard the dogs and the trackers, you know, everybody's blood pressure would go up. There would be an escalation in ventilation and breathing because you're just thinking about, okay, where are they? Because we're in, trip, in triple canopy. In triple canopy with a six man team, um, we would have a point man. And then a lot of times I'd have Sal between me and the point man. I couldn't see the point man. And I would only be two feet or three feet behind Sal, who would only be two or three feet 
behind a point man. Jesus. So the jungle, you know, and I, I, I spent a lot of time on my knees because the jungle with the vines, branches, I'd wind up have to crawl where Sal and the South Vietnamese could get around it. You know, me and my six foot two uh, pimply ass had to get down there and, and crawl through it. I wore out several pair of pants crawling so much um, in the jungle in Laos. And um, so as we escalated and they got closer with the trackers, we knew combat was coming. At that point, we'd call for TAC air, try to make a comma with Covey. And um, then the next thing would be to try to spot an LZ or a hole in the jungle big enough to get the ropes down to get pulled out by strings. And again, <clears throat> as I said earlier, uh, thanks to our indigenous troops, I mean, Sal, Hep, Fook, Sohn, we were never ambushed. When the enemy was close, our guys fired first. And then we gained superiority and pushed them back down the hill and pushed them back enough for us to move. And then we would move in that tactical way as best we could. And then, like I said, you go from mission to survival. So can I jump in on uh, and ask, um, this is an interesting question. When, when, you, when, you, when we lead a team in game, we're all playing, we've been playing this for what, 18 months as we've been developing it. And, and uh, one of the main things you do as team leader is you're, you're listening all the time, even though there's, it, there's an amazing noise of battle going on, to where the most noise is coming from, um, where the voices, where the shouts, where, where, the, where the gunshots are coming from. And you're always turning the team like a shoal of fish. You know, you, you, you're giving commands and getting people uh, to move away from the noise. Is that is that sort of a realistic thing? Do you think, or or how, how would you, as one zero, how would you direct where the team moves, or would that be the point man that's doing it? Um, <clears throat> when we were in contact, it would be instinctual within the team. Sometimes we'd have to say specifically, okay, we want to go north. And that would be between myself and Sal or whoever the senior Vietnamese team member was. But you knew where the, the majority of the contact was coming from and it would, you would react to it. And there wouldn't be a whole lot of conversation. I don't know about other teams, mm -hmm. but when we had firefights, um, we would react and then if you stayed in the same place, like we had the hilltop with Echo 4, we were there for two or three hours waiting for the TAC air to come in. And so without um, moving, we would just keep it down a single shot, try to uh, save as much ammo as possible. Other times we would be moving away from the initial contact and then you're looking for an LZ trying to get out or look for a spot that the ropes can come down. And there would be minimal combo because it all would come down to survival. And sometimes between myself and Sal, a lot of times Sal would just turn back and say, Buku VC, you know, call the King Beast. And uh, let's get the hell out of here because we knew we'd been compromised again and then just getting into survival mode. And uh, sometimes um, I would be talking to Covey, like we had one target where we had made contact. I forget from the South and maybe from the East, I forget, but they came at us from a couple of different directions. And we had been moving, trying to get to a point. Well, we knew we couldn't get there and wherever the initial contact came from, we did gun runs. And then Covey came back and said, it's near the end of the day. It was beginning to rain. And he found a hole that was near where we made initial contact. So we had to go back through that area, but we had done gun runs and we did one more gun run before we moved. And then we moved through that area which again, Sal wasn't happy, but when I told him through HEP, 
that's where we can get the strings down. If we don't get there, we're going to be here all night. And they were coming at us so hard with so many people. We knew we couldn't survive all night. Yeah, I guess I guess in our game, we're, they're getting a bit closer and from multiple sides. And uh, it sounds like you're you're getting them from one side or two sides at the most generally. Yeah. And on that one, it was just it was weird because we had initial contact. Then they came at us from other angles. And I, I forget what they is just for a point of discussion. Say we were hit from the north first mm -hmm. and then from the west. And then later, more came at us from the south. And then we did the gun runs to the north and then went through that area where we had made contact. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, we went across some dead soldiers, enemy soldiers. But at that point, it was getting dark and we didn't have time to stop, search their bodies for intel or take paperwork because they were coming at us so hard. Mm -hmm. And we um, wanted to get to that hole to see if we get the ropes down as it turns out they were able to get the ropes down and uh it was odd because that was the the jungle there was so high that the helicopter we had rain now it was raining the helicopters up there they throw the ropes down and the helicopter looked surreal almost because between the rain the clouds and we we couldn't hear it as loud as you normally would it was just odd but the ropes came down and then we hooked up and got out of there. And uh, that was one where we put a, um, um, a Willie Pete white phosphorus grenade onto a claymore and put it up on a high area. And then as we were getting extracted, we pulled the cord out. As we got far enough away, popped it. And that was, that slowed them down. And that was the first time we could actually see the enemy soldiers after fighting them in the jungle, because they had opened fire, you see the green tracers and everything else, but there's only minimal, it wasn't the eye to eye contact. It was just firing at AK and the sounds that came out of the jungle, you knew where they were. I think we, we probably got that bit right then, Tilt, because you know, you're generally shooting at um, the sound and you, you, you hardly ever see anyone. Yeah, I mean, I can remember a few times where I could say, I'm on the radio, somebody sticks his head up one round and he's dead. And another time uh, when we went through the specters, um, I had gone out away from the team. We were on a little plateau and I went to the edge of the plateau and went around the side because I was trying to direct, I was directing airstrikes and about 200, 150, 200 yards away, maybe even 300. I saw an NVA climb up a tree. He had an RPG, but no round for it. And so make a long story short, eventually somebody handed him around. He saw Sohn get up. And then he went and aimed his RPG. Well, I had, I killed him one round, but that was different than the normal firefight. We had the jungle just erupting with AKs. I called it the apocalyptic death roar between them and our car 15s and the hand grenades going off back and forth. That's what we're more used to. It's just phenomenal. I, I, it must be just uh, a mind blowing experience to, to, to be to all that noise at once and, and just the, 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 the overpressure from the bullets passing by. Oh, yeah. um, to, to say standing up and shooting at that point takes takes um, a man of courage. <laughs> well, either that or you're, you're down your knees or whatever it would be, um, and it would just go on. I mean, sometimes they were so close, they shot off our radio antenna. And uh, you just, you never think about it that way. But yeah, you hear that cracking around. And when you're at a firing range, it's firing your pistol. You put your headset on today we're out there with no headsets and we're on full automatic with car 15s and they're coming at us with AKs and we're on the other side of that AK. So you have the rounds cracking and their noise. Then you throw in some air assets for good luck. Yeah. It made for a noisy day.
what what what's what's the loudest bang you hear in the battle? Is it is it rockets from a from a um, gunship or or, or five hundred pounders? It's the five hundred pounders because they're the ones when they were danger close. You literally get elevated off the ground, and we would always um, when we knew that an A one Sky Raider was coming or if an F four was coming in with a five hundred pounder or two fifty for that for that matter, um, we would pass the word down the line, terra firma, get close, get close to the ground. And um, yeah, you get elevated by the, by the bombs. And Lynn, Lynn explained it better than that in his book. <laughs> what, what's, what's the drill for that? Do you put your hands over your ears and keep your mouth open or is that- Keep your mouth open for sure. No. And, uh, but you know, again, here's the NVA. By 68, they knew what an A1 Sky Reader was. They knew what gunships were. And if they heard them coming, they knew that those targets were going to be going for them. So the NVA developed a tactic that we called getting close to the belt. The belt would be our belt. So if they heard the aircraft coming, they would want to get as close to us as possible, any recon team or hazard force. So... If we're on the ground, we call it the airstrike. We told our guys to put their face in the, in the down or get ready. Um, meanwhile, the NVA would be coming at us harder. So we have this deadly death, death dance going on. We call it an airstrike. They hear the aircraft coming. They come at us. We blow them back. The bomb goes off. And there'll be a little bit of a pause, maybe. If they hear the helicopters coming, they come back again. That's all part of that ongoing. So yeah, I think the 500 pounder is by far the loudest. But again, there's something about an AK that's just firing at you, a bunch of them coming out of the jungle, kind of gets your attention. Yeah, I don't bet. So, so um, your your job as one zero would that be call it uh, managing the air support via via COVID? Correct. And there are times when um, if Covey wasn't there, we talk directly to the pilot. Um, but it's always better with Covey because he knew exactly where we were. <clears throat> and then we would give him the gun runs, the azimuth. And with a, any gun run or ordinance that would be dropped, you had the team, like a circle or whatever it was facing the enemy. And then the, the gun runs would be in front or alongside of or behind, but never across the team. We had a, a couple of... Um, young radio operators um, who made that mistake and had people on their team hurt because they brought in a gun run across the team as opposed to a front the way you're supposed to do it. Yeah, I guess when you, I was talking to Don Haas the other night about all this and, you know, he was saying that the, some of the, some of the Thunder Chicken pilots, you know, they, they could hit uh, something the size of a trash can with a rocket. But, but, yeah. but you, but, but you those get those fives were they were amazing and what they did in fact we had um one of our gunship crews was the judge and the executioner on one of the missions we had a recon team was on the ground the nva was above them and they were in a, a cave and they had an anti-aircraft weapon so that the team was down here the enemy was coming at them but they couldn't direct airstrikes because the cave above had anti-aircraft weapons that were that had damaged severely a couple of aircraft. The judge, so here's the cave, and the judge came from behind the cave, flew across it, and then did a 180 and turned around and pumped 275s and in, into that uh, cave, wiped it out. But just think about that. You're flying across, the, did a 180, and then open fire before the gunners could take him out. Don was telling me about uh, what they call a hammer turn, where where they basically um, do a cyclic lift and then and then a, a 180 pedal turn and then fire back on the straight down um, on the on the zone they've just flown over. So they kind of go across it. Up, That's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, rotate on the spot. Now I've never tried that in game in one of our <laughs> gunships, but um, I've got a date signed up for with Don to take him into the game 
and he and I'm going to try that with him sitting Whoa. next to me in the in the uh, in the co-pilot seat. <laughs> that that's a great tactic, man. But you know, but you're rolling the dice. I mean, it has to be so quick because if the NVA gunners are on the trigger, you you're going to buy your lunch out there. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very yeah, and I guess you'd be they, they'd be trying to surround you with 50 cows and, you know, everything they could to stop the air getting in. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Which means you're, I guess, the longer you stay in one position, the, 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 more, the more and more likely you're not going to get out. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that was part of the uh, game was they try to figure out what they were doing try to look for an LZ, look for a hole. And, uh, you know, that's why we love our aviators. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Now, in my case, in the early days, it was all South Vietnamese Air Force that would drop us off and pick us up. Later, it'd be the 101st. And then, of course, we had gunships that were attached from the 101st um, Marine Corps, Scarface. And, uh, Judging execution, they came from the Americal Division from the 176, the muskets. Just fearless men. And they're like the 195th guys. And of course, the Green Hornets down south, the missions, the, the guys of the, the 119th, the crocodiles of legend. And a lot of these guys were young, young guys, just young warrant officers out there doing their thing, completely fearless. And, uh, you know, there's um, a great, uh, admiration from the ground pounders for them. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we felt that all along from, from all you guys. To, you know, you revere the pilots that, that helped you out, the, the aviators and, and the crew. Um, yeah. And, and we, because, we, we, we put I mean, all the, the um, call signs of, of each of them. They're now in the game because you gave us the list of all the call signs who supported SOG to, to do them some, you know, to give them some honor, um, you know, to honor them. In, in the sure. game yeah yeah and um you know at times they were so close like on that echo four mission when the muskets came in on one on one gun run they were so close that the shell casings from their m60 landed in my back of my neck and i remember going oh shit because it burnt you know this is a hot shell case and that and they were so close they didn't have any time to cool off. And I had, I forget, one or two that landed in my collar. And I'm, we're, we're still in the middle of the firefight or trying to get the guys up in the helicopter. And um, to have that happen, on one hand, I'm going, oh, shit. But on the other hand, wait a minute. Thank you. I'll, I'll take the pain. Thanks. Just keep the gun rounds going, guys. <laughs> Outstanding. So, so there's this... Um relationship you you still have with the airmen now and and you meet them at SOAR and, and SFA do you yes um but you know that's <laughs> that's another one of those anomalies um here like with um at Fubai some of the air assets the muskets actually lived on base with us and we had a close rapport with them so that, so close that if Covey wasn't there, they could dial into our frequency, we'd talk them through a gun run or whatever. Um, and, but there would be so many times, I, I can't even explain it, where we would have gun runs from A1 Sky Raiders, F4 Phantom Jets, and then other supporting elements from the 101st. Well, the 101st would not come back to Fubai and here are the men that put their lives on the line for us on the ground that we never met. And the SOA back in 2013 or 2012, I forget, right around there, we made a connection with some A1 Sky Raider pilots that their sole mission was supporting Saad. This is 40 plus years after they saved our bacon, time after time. Like the guy I talked about, Tom Stump, and the guys from the, the Tailwind mission. And of course, we had Sky Raider pilots that saved us. I mean, Lynn Black specifically 
had a one mission where he remembered a Sky Raider pilot coming in so close. Finally, at the reunion, he met the guy. It was Don Deneen, Sky Raider pilot, just amazing. And they remembered that moment in time. And uh, in my last mission, one of the Sky Raiders was so close that when he did a gun run, he tilted the aircraft and he's looking for me and he saw me. And I could tell you, he was so close that I could tell you he was smoking a Philly cheroot. And I saluted that, that pilot when he went past. Now, none of these guys I knew, never met him. They went back. Some of the Jolly Green Giant guys, they would come in and pull us out, take you back, drop you off, and they had to go refuel. You never see them again. And that was one of those. And uh, as a deal where you, in, in hindsight, it's like, oh my God, you owe your life to these guys. And you never see them say thank you. And so at least through the reunions with those, uh, we've had some very memorable moments, uh, emotional moments getting caught up with guys that put their lives on the line for us. Well, I hope we've, we've done them justice too with, with including a lot of their, their aircraft and call signs and tail numbers in, you know, in the game, helping the sub guys. And it's all there in the story, you know. And you've got some of our beloved King Bees in there. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've got King Bees. We've got, we got, we got Montagnards and South Vietnamese um, soldiers in SOG. And... Uh, yeah, they're all they're all represented and there's a few little uh, easter eggs that we call them when you put something in the game that's a bit uh, a reference to something else you know so we we mentioned cowboy we mentioned sal we mentioned a few few of the team buddies uh, oh, but wow. it's all it's all sort of peppered in there just part of the lore of the game you know sure sure yeah. as it's because we see this as a commemorative thing you know to to, to keep those to keep those names alive and and, and people would be interested to know uh, who was that guy and what, what did he do? Yeah. Oh yeah. People seldom heard the stories of the valor of the South Vietnamese, the Montagnards, the Nungs. Um, and they hated communists. They hated the communists. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, that's one aspect of other Vietnam histories that are severely neglected. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, we, we've kept you for a very long time here, and, and I'm very grateful for um, you taking the time today to talk to us about all this. Um, Sam's got a, a couple of questions to finish off on, sure, and then sure. uh, and then we'll we'll wind up. Well, I'm happy because this is a unique way of um, <clears throat> giving um, exposure to what Saad did, and. Uh, you know, we, we can't, we know Hollywood weird will never do justice to what, what Sog did. So if we get the word out and it's done through a storytelling methodology that you're providing here, that's down to earth. Yeah, we know you're going to take some literary license with it. You've got a game that's really something that can be entertaining, but also historically accurate as best you can, as opposed to other games where they don't take the time or the effort to care. You've done that, you and your people or your huge staff there. So we appreciate that. So my time is your time. I'll stay here till my knees give out. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I can't wait to get you into the game and put you in a King Bee and, uh, and fly you over the fence just to, just to see what happens. You know, will you sweat? I sweat like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Go ahead, Sam, shoot. so, you know, this is kind of crazy after going through all this really, really serious and, 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 uh, heavy stuff, but just to, I guess, kind of lighten the mood a little bit, were there any moments that stood out to you that maybe were kind of more lighthearted, funny type things, or just, uh, weird, unusual type moments that happened to you while you were in SOG? Oh, absolutely. Um, you, you know, some of the stories are, are funnier. Like when we were in Echo 4, we had been on the ground maybe two hours. And we heard this noise in the jungle coming towards us. We assumed it was the NVA. The team lined up. We pulled the pin on the hand grenades. And we were ready for mortal combat. We got overrun by, what do you call it? 
monkeys, a herd of monkeys, a flock of monkeys, a whole lot of monkeys. We got overrun here right across us. And we're standing there going like, WTF? <laughs> put the pins back in the grenades, put the tree, put the safety back on. And uh, another team with the Lynn Black, they were out with Idaho and the Frenchman. They had been on the ground for two, two and a half days. And they knew that they were being tracked. So finally, they heard the noise getting closer to them. So Lynn did the same thing, lined the team up, pulled the pins on the grenades. They figured well, whoever is following us, when they come out, this is it. We're tired of this. It's time to have a meeting with these guys. They lined up. They were orangutans. And the orangutans had been following them for two days and during the night, they would keep an eye on them. So finally, they, they broke through and they saw each other. And at one point, <laughs> Lynn was doing something with his hand and then one of the orangutans did it. So at one point he gave him the Italian salute. The orangutan <laughs> did the same thing right back. <laughs> now that wow. wasn't my story, but that's Lynn Black and, and the Frenchman, you know? And then we had, uh, we had the night at Fubai where we're watching um, a battle of George General oh. Custer's, Custer's last stand. I love this. Yeah, so as, and we have a sheet. We don't have a movie screen, there's a sheet. And so at the, one of the final scenes, the Indians are coming over the hill, a couple of the Indians got up with their AK, I mean, with their M16s and opened fire on, on the sheet, tore it up. And so all future movies, it, the Indians had to leave their weapons back, back <laughs> in, their, in their camp. And then finally, one of the little people goes, call in the, call in the King Bees, get the Air Force here to do a gun run. <laughs> Help out Custer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I was laughing out loud because you talked you talked about that in your book. And I was just laughing out loud. I was sitting there making dinner. and I just kind of lost it. That's so great. <laughs> well, yeah. And then we had a we had one of our Green Beret medics. Now, this is a medic who's a great medic and he's a fearless guy, just a great recon guy. He came into our hooch, picked up a, um, it was a nine millimeters, either a grease gun or um, a Swedish K. And he forgot that it fired from the open bolt. <laughs> he picked up, hit the trigger, jacked off four or five rounds, went through the screen, went through the officer's quarters, fortunately he didn't get anybody. About two weeks later, Spider had a, a scope on his car 15. And that same medic who will remain nameless here, <laughs> <laughs> he, he picked up the car 15. Go, oh, this is really cool. And he's sighting through it. He pulled the trigger. Again, two or three rounds went off. But this time, the rounds went through the screen, went through one of the uh, barracks behind us, and it wounded one of the indigenous troops. And the sergeant major came in really pissed. He goes, you shot him, you fix him. <laughs> so the medic had to go out and uh, patch up the guy he shot by mistake. But those are the little Jesus. moments like that. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't have wanted to be that guy. <laughs> no. And, you know, you have these little stories that are stranger, like um, – John Walton was on a patrol when he was at uh, he was down at Contoon, and they had to come out of the jungle. And they were going up a mountain trail, and they got to the top of the mountain. They took a lunch break. They were beat. They're tired. And when it was time to move out, the point man went around a corner, took two or three steps, and opened fire on full automatic. On the other side of the mountain there was an NVA company coming up to get them. So here you have the recon team with John, which was uh, RT Louisiana. That was his team. He was the one zero at the time, even though he's a medic and a good medic. And uh, they had a hundred or so NVA on the other side of the mountain. So they're able to tactically withdraw, use their claymores, and then they use the M79 as artillery to come in on top of the heads of the NVA on the other side of the mountain. But that's one of those little ironic moments in time, you know? 
having lunch. Point man gets up, takes two or three steps, and you're gaze in full Mortal Kombat. NBA, NBA had the same idea, I guess. Same. It must have been yeah, a good place for lunch. For us, they found us a little bit quicker. Again, our point man, John's point man, was quicker on the draw than their people were. Uh, that's wow. <laughs> oh yeah. I can't imagine the feeling <laughs> of turning around the corner. Oh, okay. Yeah. This after is, nice uh, lunch. You had a nice place. lunch up there. Got a little sunshine, a little tan. <laughs> oh lord. Well, thank you so much, Till. Um, I, I mean the just especially from the team because you may not realize it but there's a team of 120 guys and girls behind us and uh for the last couple of years working with with sog veterans with yourself and ken and jim and and some of the aviators you've brought along um joe driscoll and gordon deniston and oh yeah barry pensek and uh and don haas and you know We've had uh, we had uh, John Plaster in the early days uh, giving us some advice as well, and, and it's it's kept the uh, the team so motivated because we want to do the right you know create create the authentic experience that that matches or gets clo as close as we can to the experiences you guys had when you were over over there and over and, over, and uh, on the ground, um, and it's been really a unique experience to, to, to be creating this thing that's based on your actual experiences. Um, and then to have you look over our shoulder for the whole of the time and tell us your stories as you've done and send us all the podcasts that, you, that as you've been doing them. Um, and, and it's kept everybody so on their toes and so, so keen to, to do a good job. Um, it's, it's a tiring old thing making a game. Um, but, but with, uh, but, you know, because you guys have been there, it's kept us all really going. Well, uh, us old gray heads appreciate what you're doing with your 120 plus troops there. Um, like we said early on, the fact that you're dedicating that mission to sod type missions, which will do more than Hollywood ever could do, which is a way we'll get to a younger generation that people in America who will never hear about SOG, particularly these days in public schools. They don't talk about uh, real history or they don't even try. They've got other PC stuff that they're throwing out. No more civics, no more real history. So this is one way to come out with a story that'll get people's interest and hopefully someday they'll come around and maybe look at the books or other productions that will at least expose them to a history that America's never heard about. And I Absolutely. Your end. We thank you for that, for being serious about it. Well, thank you for helping us create the game. You know, you're, you're in it. Uh, your stories and experiences are gonna light up a whole generation of gamers um, as they get lit up by the NVA. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's been, I have to say, it's just been a real honor to work with you and, and thank you. Well, as, as, uh, we have the Mutual Admiration Society here, Rob. So. Um, it's, it's our honor and a pleasure to do it because you've convinced us of your seriousness and your people's dedication to this has uh, been remarkable and it's been encouraging. You know, at first, for the first 20 years, we couldn't even talk about it. And then we finally could talk about it, nobody gave a shit. And uh, now that people are hearing about SOG through the mm -hmm. podcast and now even through a video game, that'll be the, I, I think it's gonna be the first of its kind to be really serious. Uh, there's like a two prong, they can have fun, but they're also gonna learn a little bit about a, a war that went on for a while that nobody knew about for eight years. Well, I thank you, I tip my hat to you all. Thank you. 